Our first speaker has a physics degree from the ANU, the Australian National University down in Canberra, won a university medal, Woo thank you very much, um, and got a PhD from the ANU as well. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New South Wales and then decided, that's enough of Australia. I think it's time to go overseas and went over and did a postdoc over in Amsterdam as well. Um, she's got hundreds of papers, thousands of citations on those papers, and her work on plasmonic solar cells has been featured in the news sections of Science Magazine, The Economist. In 2010, her work on nanophotonic light trapping was listed as one of MIT Technology Review's 10 most important emerging technologies, which is pretty darn cool, you have to admit. In 2011, she was, like, that's cool, but in 2011, she was an episode winner on ABC TV's New Inventors. So she's not just an amazing academic, she's actually taking the stuff out there and putting it on TV and going, what do you reckon? Buy that. That's awesome. I think that's great. In 2015, she was awarded the John Booker Medal in Engineering Science from the Australian Academy of Science. She's at the Research School of Engineering at the Australian National University. Please make our very first ISS 2017 speaker very, very welcome in the usual style, Professor Kylie Tatchpole. Thank you very much, Chris, for that very enthusiastic introduction. We're at a fundamental transition in the way we produce energy. We've got an enormously growing energy demand, and at the same time, we have this urgent need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. We're moving from a past dominated by fossil fuels to a future that's going to be entirely different. And the exciting thing is, this is not about the future, this is about now. This is already happening, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. First of all, for a little bit of context, what's been happening with the climate? Well, 2016 was the hottest year on record. This graph shows you the temperature anomaly, so that's the change in temperature compared to the average temperature across the 20th century. And you can see that's just been rising, and it's been rising uh, ever since the 1960s, and that culminated in 2016 being the hottest year on record. We can look at what happened in Australia of that year. In March, we had record-breaking heat in a number of places around Australia. In Canberra, where I'm from, as you can see, it's about uh, 300 kilometres south of Sydney, for those people not from Australia. Uh, we had 10 days in March, which is actually autumn, of, of 30 degrees C over and above. In Sydney, they had 39 uh, consecutive days above 26 degrees. So that's uh, record-breaking heat all across Australia, also, in summer this year, we had extremely hot days. So this is uh, a change that we're seeing in Australia. We're seeing similar sorts of changes across the world. What happens if we keep going this way? Well, there's been predictions um, by the Bureau of Meteorology about what may happen to Australia as a result of all this. We can expect then, under business as usual, if we don't change what we're doing, that Australia would be 10 to 20 percent drier by 2070 and three to four degrees hotter on average. And it's important always to, to look at the context, what do these kinds of numbers mean. Globally, the world is about five degrees hotter than in the last ice age. So that gives you an idea globally of what five degrees temperature change means. It means dramatic changes in all the world's systems. So this is something we absolutely need to avoid. But at the same time, so we have these challenges in terms of climate change, in terms of the effect of carbon dioxide emissions on the world's atmosphere. However, all of this is a result of using more energy and producing emissions from using that energy. Uh, and using that energy has enabled great changes in our society that have been overall for the benefit. And if you look at uh, this graph here, shows you the world uh, total energy that was used and also the GDP, the gross domestic product. So that's overall how wealthy we are. And what we've seen is that they've been growing more or less in step. So using more energy 
generally means that we have more stuff, we use more stuff, uh, it tends to mean that overall we're wealthier. So it's not a simple thing to solve. And this shows you quite uh, graphically, I think, in this picture here. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? <laughs> Any ideas? North Korea. North Korea, exactly. This black section here is North Korea. This is South Korea. So this shows you very visually the differences in levels of development of countries. So using uh, a lot of energy is uh, related to the, the level of developments of the country. So let's look at this a little bit more quantitatively and say, okay, uh, what are we actually trying to achieve here? This shows you the fossil fuel emissions in gigatons of carbon per year and the top line there shows you where we're heading if we don't change what we're doing, business as usual. And the bottom line shows you where we need to go if we want to stabilize carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere at around 500 parts per million. They're around 400 at the moment. This is getting more and more challenging, but this is where you need to go to. And you can see the size of the gap there. That's, that's the end of the green section by 2060 or so. That's the size of the gap. And if you look at that size, it's about equivalent to the all the emissions at the moment. So it's about equivalent to all the entire power across the world. So this is what we need to achieve by 2050, by 2060. We need to produce as much clean energy as we currently have energy across the entire world. This is the size of the problem, okay? This is what we need to fix. All right, so let's get an idea of what those sorts of numbers are because we're talking about very large numbers here, terawatts, which is not usually a particularly familiar unit. So we can start off with watts. A watt also is about the amount of power that you need to power a laptop, something like that. And then we go up in orders of magnitude. So uh, if we multiply that by a factor of 1,000, we get a kilowatt, which is more or less what you need to power your toaster. You multiply that by 1,000 again, and you get a megawatt, uh, which is the amount of power, if you have an electrically powered plane, uh, you might use that kind of amount of power to power a small plane. If you multiply that by a factor of 1,000 again, we get a gigawatt, and now you're talking about the size of a coal-fired power station, something like that, gigawatt, okay, 10 to the 9 watts. And we multiply that by 1,000 again, and then we get terawatts. So now you're talking about uh, amounts comparable to the amount of energy, the amount of power the whole world is using. Uh, so we're talking about we need about 15 terawatts of clean power. And you can get an idea then of just how big that number is. So at the moment, we're producing most of our power using electromagnetism. Essentially, uh, we heat up some, some water, create steam. We heat it up with a variety of methods, fossil fuels. We create that steam. We run it through a turbine, and then we can use it to create electricity. So that's the, that's the general principle that we're talking about here. So we're mostly doing that with coal uh, because we have a lot of it and because it's cheap, but of course it produces a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, we also do the same thing with gas, again, just burning the gas, create the steam, run a turbine, uh, and then you can produce electricity. Uh, it's not quite as bad as coal at producing carbon dioxide emissions, uh, but it still puts a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We've got some other options, of course. Uh, this is wind power. Wind, you're essentially doing the same thing, except to turn the turbine instead of using uh, steam that you've uh, created from, from burning a fossil fuel, you're actually directly turning the turbine using the power of the wind. And then we have uh, the many variations of solar power. So I'm going to talk uh, a lot about solar power tomorrow, so I'm going to just talk uh, briefly about solar power today, but we have uh, quite a variety of different 
uh, different types of solar power, including so solar photovoltaics you'll see on people's roofs, also solar hot water you'll see in people's roofs. Uh, you also have to include passive solar because we can just directly heat uh, houses from the sun uh, and solar thermal electricity where we're uh, creating very high temperatures and also uh, creating steam to run a turbine. Australia is particularly lucky in terms of energy. We have a vast array of different types of energy resources. So this is a map of Australia showing you all the different types of uh, energy resources we have available. And you'll see uh, there's various uh, gas reserves all around the place. Uh, there's lots of coal reserves all over the places. Uh, we have heaps of uranium. Um, but we also have a wide range of renewable resources as well. We have a lot of wind. We have an enormous amounts of solar across the entire country. Uh, and we also have some geothermal energy available. So Australia has uh, bucket loads of energy, so very many choices in terms of where we get our energy from. It's different for other countries around the world. They may have more or less resources. Some of them have particular types of resources, and some don't have very many. So we can expect... Even in the future, we're going to need to sort of trade those resources. And uh, for Australia, we can expect to export energy. So this shows you how, where Australia's energy goes at the moment. And this is uh, more or less the main thing that you need to know uh, about uh, Australian energy politics, in fact. Uh, because what this graph is showing is where energy comes from and goes to in Australia. And it comes from, you can see, lots of different types uh, of fossil fuels, also some uranium, bucket loads of coal. And then where does it go to? Well, it goes to lots of different places. It gets transformed uh, into electricity. Uh, it, it again gets used uh, in also lots of different sectors within Australia, so commercial, residential, mining, transport, manufacturing. But the biggest thing that you notice, of course, is that most of it is going to export. And this is the reason that coal is so popular uh, in Australia. Australia gets a lot of its money from exporting coal. Uh, so politically, this is why uh, both the major parties are very supportive of coal, because it brings a lot of money into Australia. So the energy transition for Australia also involves looking at uh, what happens when we, when we move away from coal and we have to think about uh, other exports instead. So I've said that Australia has uh, a lot of uh, resources, all so sorts of resources. Overall, the world has an enormous amount of renewable resources. This is in contrast to fossil fuels where the resource is in fact quite finite. Renewable resources, of course, uh, means that you can keep using them uh, as long as you would like. Uh, we've said that we need uh, around 15 terawatts or so. So where are we going to get that 15 terawatts? Uh, lots of choices. Uh, there's some available from hydro. Uh, there's, there's a fair bit available from, from tides. Uh, there's also geothermal. is a fairly significant resource, as is wind. Uh, and on top of that, we have buckets and buckets of solar power available to us. So very many choices, uh, particularly hard to ignore is the enormous amount of solar radiation that's hitting the Earth all the time. And just an example of how things have been changing and why I said at the beginning that the future is now. This is what's happened to the cost of solar panels over the last 40 years or so. So in the 1970s, your solar panel that produces electricity from solar cost around $100 per watt, okay? And it was too expensive. Of course, it was too expensive. Now, the price is less than 50 cents per watt. So the price has fallen by a factor of 200 or so. And that's completely changed uh, what we can do with solar energy. So you can then see, as a result of it, that, this is what's happened to the installations. In the 1970s, we had around 2 megawatts of uh, solar going in, uh, and now it's more than 64 
1,000 megawatts. So we've completely changed the economics of solar power and that's completely changed the amount of installation that's got, been going in. And that's been due to uh, technology development and also through to economies of scale just by making more and more panels and installing them. So the result of this is if you keep coming down in price, and which is what's been happening, the price has been coming down, at the same time the price of your standard conventional electricity has actually been going slightly up. At a certain point the prices cross over, you get what we call grid parity, which is what happened uh, a few years ago, and it then becomes worthwhile to install solar and you see uh, enormous increases in the amount of solar being installed. So this is where we've come to. Then, wind now costs about 7 to 10 cents per kilowatt hour to install. Solar photovoltaic solar panels, uh, 9 to 13, similar sort of price. Gas and coal, if you're putting in a new power station, 7 to 12. This means that new renewable energy is actually competitive with new fossil fuels. So people that are investing in these technologies have to decide, okay, which one am I going to install? And then suddenly the wind and solar is starting to look a lot less risky because, of course, with the fossil fuels we have the prospect of carbon prices, we have the prospect of not being able to emit carbon dioxide emissions into the future, and for coal we're talking 40 years into the future. This is a long time, you have to be sure that it's not going to be constrained. Uh, and so wind and solar get to be a lot more attractive to install. So we've seen this then uh, across the world. This is what's happening. If you look at the new capacity that's being added each year in the last couple of years, this is what's the amount of fossil fuel that's being, fossil power that's being installed. Uh, a little bit of nuclear, a moderate amount of hydro, that's uh, in generally in developing countries because the number of locations available is decreasing all the time. Uh, wind and PV, both very large, and then a small amount of other technologies. But you notice if you put the wind and PV together, there's now more new wind and solar being installed each year than new fossil fuels. So we've really reached a tipping point in the way we're producing energy, in what we're installing, in the type of energy system that we're creating. So overall, we can see there's a revolution happening in the type of energy that's being installed. What we can expect to see then from now on is the amount of fossil fuels gradually goes down. The amount of clean energy being installed keeps increasing uh, and especially uh, will be dominated by solar and wind uh, with a few other technologies in the mix as well. So uh, now that's given you the kind of context for the change in the energy systems that we're seeing. I'm going to talk a bit about the technologies that's going to contribute uh, to that transition in the energy system. So I've mentioned a few of them. We've got photovoltaics, solar thermal, batteries, pumped hydro, wind uh, and geothermal. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, those technologies now. First of all, uh, starting with solar. And I mentioned there's a few different types of solar, so it's important to know uh, what you're talking about. So this is solar photovoltaics. It's when you have the light coming in directly, hitting your solar panel, directly creating electricity without any moving parts. Uh, so these are the sorts of things you see uh, in residential systems especially. Uh, this is different size systems on houses, about uh, one-ish kilowatts, about five-ish kilowatts. So these are the sorts of sizes of systems that you see on people's houses and they can offset all the electricity for an energy efficient house. So you can easily produce uh, all the electricity you need with these sorts of systems for a household. <coughs> you can have systems that are a lot bigger, of course. So this shows you uh, one that's out in western New South Wales in, in Ningen. Uh, it's around 100 megawatts. So remember the sizes that we were talking about previously. On the, on the houses we had like one kilowatt or so now we're talking about 100 megawatts, so 100,000 or so times 
larger. So these are, can be very, very large systems, and then they'll feed into the grid and uh, produce energy for a range of different types of households. Uh, importantly, I mentioned uh, photovoltaics, PV, solar panels, because they're going to be such a large contributor to the energy system. So we see here that it's photovoltaics and wind, uh, whereas if you look at all of the other technologies that's being installed at the moment, the, the levels are much smaller. So it's important to look at, uh, there will be a range of technologies contributing, but they won't all contribute in the same way. Okay, so that was the solar photovoltaics, which is, you can see quite commonly on people's roofs, but there are other solar technologies. I'm going to talk now about solar thermal. It's less uh, commonly heard of, but solar thermal is interesting because it has some nice possibilities for storing energy uh, directly. So there's different types of solar thermal, but basically the idea is you have some kind of concentrating system. You have a light coming in, it uh, heats up a fluid, and then that fluid you can use to create steam, uh, to turn a turbine, and produce electricity. Okay, so quite simple conceptually. There's a range of different uh, implementations. Here's some long troughs. Here's some dishes. Uh, this one is a tower, so the light comes in and hits all these mirrors all around the place, and then is directed up to here, which get, then gets extremely hot. Uh, so there's a range of different uh, implementations of them. So I mentioned the possibility of storage with these types of systems, which is pretty nice. So the idea here is the light comes in, hits all these mirrors, gets bounced up to here. Uh, so we've got heat, and then that hot fluid can actually be kept hot and kept separately, kept uh, till you need it for later. And uh, this particular system is a 20 megawatt system. It's got 15 hours storage. This means it can operate 74% capacity factor, that means it can operate 74% of that 24 hours. Some of them can actually operate for the 24 hours. So basically, it's operating day or night, even though the only energy input is coming from, uh, from solar. So the way this works is here the, the light comes in, uh, you go and heat up this area over here, you then transfer the hot fluids uh, to these molten salt tanks. So you have this very hot uh, molten salt that's sitting there at 500 degrees or so, and then it can stay there until you want it. And then at that point, you can use that molten salt to create steam, to turn a turbine, uh, to produce electricity. So in that way, you can have storage actually integrated into your solar power plant. Another one of the options I mentioned was wind. I said that wind is going to be one of the largest contributors uh, as well. It's also a, a large resource in many places around uh, Australia. So wind has been growing for a long time uh, and we're seeing that uh, now. So as a result, it's, it's contributing uh, quite substantially. So it's been growing 30% or so uh, for the past 15 years. Compare that with average growth rates of any particular industry, might be 5% or something for a, for a mature industry. So if you're growing at 30% per year, it only takes a certain number of years before you're suddenly making a very big impact. Uh, so wind is, is going to be one of the largest contributors. We can work out how much that we would need uh, for Australia, for example. Uh, we can calculate that we would need maybe 1% of Australia if we were going to produce all of our energy from wind power. So in, in reality, it would be some kind of mix uh, of, of wind and solar and maybe some other things, uh, but certainly the amount of resource that we've got available is, is well large enough. And this shows you one of the largest uh, wind farms that we've got in Australia, 420 megawatts. So again, remembering uh, how big a megawatt is, maybe half, 420 megawatts, maybe half a coal-fired power station, something like that. Uh, these things are very big. So uh, 112 metre diameter of its rotors, uh, 3 megawatts per, um, per system. So 112 metre diameter starts to be challenging, actually. Uh, each, of course, that means the radius is only about 60 metres, but it means that even getting these things along a road 
is quite difficult. You want to make sure that your row doesn't have too many bends in it. Uh, it's got a capacity factor of 35%. That means it can operate 35% of your 24 hours and it costs about $1 billion. So very big business these days, a um, lot of money invested. Uh, geothermal is one of our other options. So the idea with geothermal is we're actually using the thermal energy from inside the earth. So uh, of course it's very hot inside the earth, so that's uh, useful. The difficult thing is it's quite a long way down, generally, and so not terribly accessible. So what we need to do is somehow access that energy. And in certain places around the earth, then the, that heat actually gets transferred fairly close to the surface. And in that case, we can do the same thing. We can use that heat uh, to create steam to run a turbine. If you look at where the geothermal uh, places around the earth are, you see that uh, they're especially on the, on the edges of the continental plates. So in those kinds of areas, we tend to bring the heat close to the surface of the Earth, and so we can easily access that heat. So the areas such as uh, Japan, for example, New Zealand, for example, those areas tend to be really good for geothermal because we've got a lot of that easily accessible heat close to the surface. Uh, you'll notice Australia is, is not one of those places. So we do have geothermal energy available, but not super close to the surface. So in Australia, people have been trying to use geothermal uh, because there's some nice hot rocks uh, around, but they're three kilometres or so down. Now, three kilometres down, quite difficult. You can uh, drill down that far, but it's not trivial. But the idea would be, if you can, you drill down, uh, you sort of fracture these rocks, uh, and you can uh, inject some water, and then you can get steam coming up which you can then run a turbine. So there's certainly enough resource available there, uh, and if we used it, uh, we could generate a substantial amount of our electricity that way, uh, but it's quite expensive to actually drill down and, and get it. Uh, it's important to note also that geothermal resources are sort of renewable. So they're renewable in that if you leave them alone, they will recharge and you will get the heat back um, because the earth is, is hot and you'll have that heat coming to the surface. But the rate that you extract the energy uh, from geothermal actually tends to cool down that area. So you'd actually only use it for probably tens of years and then you'd have to move your geothermal extraction to somewhere else where it's now hotter. Uh, so this shows you uh, a pilot plant that was built in Australia. Uh, you can see that it's a megawatt. Now remembering a megawatt is somewhat less than one of those wind turbines that we saw. So not, not a huge amount of energy. So people have been trying that, but in Australia uh, we don't really have the right sort of resources. In other countries, of course, they do. Uh, and uh, Japan, New Zealand, uh, Iceland, places like that uh, may well get a lot of their energy from geothermal. So I've mentioned especially uh, wind and photovoltaic solar, and this raises the question of reliability for energy because these sources are intermittent, they're not operating all the time, so we have to figure out then how can we have an energy system that is in fact operating all the time. And so there's a few things that you need to look at for this. Uh, geographical dispersion, so you need to put the things in different places. Uh, so in Australia, we can put wind turbines in uh, Victoria, for example. We can have solar systems in Queensland. Uh, we can have that diversity, also the technical diversity, the different types of systems. And as a result, uh, we don't have the same issues with intermittency because the different types of systems are operating at different times. We can also think about uh, when our loads are actually operating. At the moment, we have a lot of electricity required in the night because we deliberately made it that way because that's the way they work best with coal-powered stations. Uh, so we can change that back again so that we have more loads in the daytime. And we can have a range of different types 
of storage and to put together in the system also. So let's have a look at the storage options that are available to us. So what we're plotting here is the cost uh, per unit energy and per unit power of different types of storage systems. Now different types of storage systems have different purposes. For example, really short term uh, storage you have things like uh, flywheels which are just like smoothing out small fluctuations in the energy system uh, and then long term storage you, ha you have things like uh, pumped hydro which I'm going to be talking about shortly. Uh, and then, then we ha also have uh, batteries in there as well. But there's a range of different technologies available to us. Uh, what, we, what we see from here is that some of the cheapest things are pumped hydro. So I'm going to be talking about that now. What is pumped hydro? What am I talking about? Pumped hydro means basically using excess energy that you have available at a certain time to pump water uphill. So when we have extra energy from solar, extra energy from wind, what we can do with that extra energy is to use it to turn a turbine and pump some water uphill. And that means that later, when we don't have enough electricity, what we can do is let the water run down the hill and turn the turbine and produce electricity. So in that way, we have a very nice, very simple type of storage system. So pumped hydro is actually the vast majority of any type of electricity storage uh, on the grid today. So you have a look at the, all the different types of storage people are using, little bits of various types of batteries, a huge amount of pumped hydro. So 99% of the total storage capacity on the grid is pumped hydro. So it's a very well uh, established technology. This shows you a system which is built in the Snowy Mountains. So that's a few hundred kilometres from Canberra, maybe five, six hundred kilometres uh, from Sydney. Uh, and so what you can see is that it pumps the water about 150 metres up uh, and as a result you can get about 1,500 megawatts of, of power when you want it by allowing the, the water to run back downhill. So a very simple, very old type of technology very well established, already commercialised and already the cheapest. So uh, pumped hydro is not necessarily the, uh, related to a river. This is the important point because hydroelectricity, you normally think, oh, you have to have some kind of river system and we've dammed all our river systems that we want to dam and we don't want to dam anymore to, because we don't want to create any more environmental consequences. But pumped hydro is different because you don't actually need a river. So this shows you uh, an example of a system that they're planning to build in Montana in the US. So we have a lower reservoir, a dam here, another one up on the hill, and, and connecting them we have a pipe, uh, which might, might be through a tunnel, might be through an open pipe, uh, but basically what you're having is circulating between these two reservoirs. You don't actually need any kind of river at all. So when you want when you've got extra uh, energy, you can just pump some water uphill. When you need it, you can let it come downhill. And the only water that you need is to replace any water that you lose from evaporation. So it actually uses a lot less water than, for example, coal-fired power stations. So uh, at ANU, there's been a study done looking at, OK, suppose we know now we're going to have lots of wind uh, and solar. Uh, we know that um, pumped hydro is, is the cheapest storage technology. Let's have a look at the technical feasibility of putting it all together and saying, okay, with existing technologies, could we actually put the whole system together and get 100% renewables in Australia? So uh, these were the assumptions. We had 90% uh, wind and photovoltaics with 10% the, the hydro that we already have. Uh, they put in the existing prices for all these types of things. They've looked at the 30-minute demand, every 30 minutes, how much electricity are we using? And then we can say, okay, what's the, what's the cost of all this? What's this system going to uh, cost? 
Uh, and this shows you the, the solution that they came up with. So we have, they divided up Australia into a whole uh, lot of different sections and uh, put the sorts of uh, energy generation systems that you would need in different places. For example, you'd have uh, lots of solar up in Queensland. You'd have uh, lots of solar and wind around in South Australia. And you connect them all up with the electricity grid and say, OK, uh, how does that look if we put all of that together? And what they find is that you can easily integrate then 100% renewable. So technically, this is not difficult. It can be done using existing technology and uh, with very slight increases in price to the overall system as a whole uh, at we've, at we've got it. So these are the sorts of uh, uh, prices that you're already seeing uh, for electricity in Australia at, at the moment. So very similar sorts of prices. And of course, we're expecting to see a lot of extra types of load as we have more electric cars, and you can integrate these into the system uh, as well. So overall, it shows that, that technically we can actually move in this direction if we want to. We've got the, we've got the technologies available to us. Uh, so I've talked there uh, about pumped hydro, which is uh, certainly available. It can be used in many different locations, and it's currently uh, the cheapest technology, but it's not the only one. We've got a lot of other choices as well, uh, and notably batteries, because battery technology is developing really fast. Uh, the reason for this uh, technology de development, and this is important for understanding technology development as a whole, is that there's been a huge market pull for battery development. For a long time, nothing really happened with battery development. Batteries pretty much stayed still in technology. And then 20 years or so ago, people started developing phones and laptops, and then suddenly everyone wanted a better battery. Right? And because of that, the battery te te technology developed. There was an increasing investment in battery technology. And as a result, uh, we have better and better batteries now for various types of applications. It's made possible batteries in electric vehicles, uh, and it's also made possible batteries in, uh, in mass storage applications and also for home storage applications. So this is what happens uh, when you have a technology being developed. It gets better and better. It gets cheaper and cheaper if you have the market pull for it. So the, what's happened with batteries is we've seen a dramatic reduction in the price of batteries. You can see here in 2005 or so, you were looking at uh, something like $1,300 uh, per kilowatt hour. It's now more like 300. So a factor of three or so uh, just in the, in the past 10 or so years. So dramatic reductions in the price of batteries. And that's expected to continue well into the future. And as a result, we'll have a lot more choices of for, for storage. You're already starting to, to see that. I don't want to give the impression that it's all about technology, though. So technology is really important, and the developments in technology is what's allowed the price come, to come down enough so that we can install all these new types of solar and wind. So that's, that's been hugely important. And if we didn't have that technology developed, none of this would be happening. But it's not the only thing that's important. And I just want to illustrate this uh, by looking at what happened uh, over the past few years when Australia uh, implemented and then removed uh, a price on carbon. So what happened here, uh, this shows you the change in electricity generation by, by fuel type. So this is black line is, is black coal. Uh, the brown line is brown coal, and then we have the other types of generation here. So what happens when the uh, overall the amount of coal in the mix was, was gradually declining uh, when a carbon price was implemented? That tended to make the amount of brown coal being used decrease. And when the carbon price was removed, we saw an increase in the amount of uh, of coal being used again. So these types of policy signals also have a different, also make a difference. So we've got to uh, include that in our thinking. 
not only policy signals, but also other things we have to think about are efficiency uh, as well. And uh, this, I think, is a nice uh, telling example. There was a survey of uh, a number of uh, companies, and apparently uh, over 50% of companies had no energy management system and have not invested in energy efficiency at all. Okay? Half of companies haven't, uh, haven't done this. And why? Uh, half of them said uh, that they didn't think it was important enough, uh, but almost 40% said it hadn't occurred to them. They hadn't even thought about energy efficiency, let alone actually made any attempt to see if they could save some money uh, by investing in energy efficiency. Uh, so some of these things you can make dramatic effects just by actually putting a little bit of, of effort into it. Uh, and I'll show you an example of this that relates to uh, Canberra. So this is uh, Canberra, when I, where I come from. It is somewhat colder than Sydney, I have to admit. So uh, people were saying here we had uh, six degrees minimum in Sydney, and that was very cold. Well, in Canberra, we had minus six, so that was, uh, that was colder. Uh, but we do actually have better heating systems in Canberra, and better, <laughs> better, better insulation. Uh, so there's lots of scope in Sydney, not only in, in Canberra. Uh, so this shows you the uh, greenhouse gas emissions for a, a household in Canberra. And you're looking at around 12 to 16 tonnes of carbon dioxide per household every year. Okay, just emitting that, that much carbon dioxide. Why? Uh, because we have some gas heating, but most houses are not super well insulated. A lot of them are using electric hot water. Uh, a lot of people using low efficiency uh, appliances uh, and low efficiency cooking and lighting. And so overall you get this 12 to 16 tonnes uh, per year. What you can do if you make an effort and not with not a very large cost, you can dramatically uh, reduce that to only around five or so tonnes uh, per, uh, per year uh, by insulating, so not very expensive by changing to solar hot water and um, by using more efficient appliances and uh, are turning off appliances when you're not using them. And so this is the advantage of actually looking at this kind of thing, thinking about it and actually doing, doing the calculations and figuring out how, how much difference you, you can make. And I want to give an example of a former student of mine who actually looked at his own house and said, uh, you know, okay, well, what can we do? My family is very environmentally conscious and we spend a lot of time switching off lights every day. And he did the calculations and he finally figured out that their electric hot water heater was using vastly more than they could ever make a difference by turning these lights off all the time. Okay, so they didn't realise that it was the electric hot water system that was making the difference. So these are the sorts of things that you guys can do. You can bring this insight, bring this numeracy, because you know these sorts of things. You can do the calculations. You can make the difference. Okay? There's opportunities like this absolutely everywhere, uh, but not everybody can do this. So overall, we've seen that the world's energy system is at the beginning of a major transformation. It's not going to be simple, but we know now that we can do it, and we know that we need to do it. It's, that's, that's very clear. It's going to happen in the next 50 years. It has to happen in the next 50 years. We've also seen that. The climate consequences of, uh, of not solving this problem are, are really very severe. It's going to need new skills, new thinking, new innovation. Uh, we need new, highly skilled science and technology people in order to actually make all this happen. It's starting now, uh, but we need, to, we need to make it happen. So there's lots of opportunities here, and overall I think it's a fantastic time to be 17 years old and starting a career in science and technology. Thank you.